All right. Well, evening. Thank you for coming to this is our fourth installment of Designing Key West. No, but in all seriousness, thank you for coming. It's our fourth installment, uh, and today we'll be looking at green buildings, uh, adaptive planning, as well as disaster planning. And the nexus of that for all the conversations we've had previously is if, unfortunately, and we always say, if, God forbid, a storm were to hit Key West and we had extensions damage, we would be looking at trying to build it back and build it back better. So here's an opportunity for us, again, through the land development regulations to think in terms of what are the strategies we want to put in place in order to have a more resilient community and a more adaptive community as we deal with issues such as climate change and sea level rise. And we think it's important as we start to look at some of the areas in our communities that are vulnerable, how it is that we can provide today for protection as well as looking into the future uh, to provide protection. And if there's a possibility for us to be able to have a stronger community to, again, as I'm thinking in terms of BPAS, uh, being able to make a case to the state that there's an opportunity for us to get additional units here because we have the ability to survive storm events of all types. So with that, again, I'd like to introduce our team leader, which is uh, Richard, who will uh, kind of take us through one of these last components. And again, this is a, a very important component as we look to the future. Richard. Thank you. Oh, I guess you don't need this one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good evening again. Uh, welcome. Thank you, everybody, for, for coming. Um, with me, I have uh, Gianno Fioli. He's our, one of our landscape architects and uh, urban designers. And of course, uh, my right hand, um, Nikisha Smith. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and begin a little bit. Most of you have seen this slide already. Um, just a little bit about who we are. Uh, again, we started in 1937. We're a local South Florida firm. Um, we started with um, a two-person survey team uh, to today we have a, a little over 300 employees uh, providing a variety of uh, mostly municipal uh, and, and land development and planning services. This just gives you an idea of, of the, uh, the various disciplines that we work in. Um, which is very nice, so anytime a question comes up, um, particularly with we had you know, discussion on stormwater, uh, we were able to go to our, our in-house sort of expert on, on stormwater management and systems and, and, and talk to him about um, sort of best practices. So again, this, this is the team. Um, these are sort of the areas that we're bringing everybody together in on. Um, some of these you've seen, some are still working back at, at the office, um, and as we begin to continue to draft and formulate these, um, you'll, you'll see a much more, a much more clear picture from, from sort of these general um, concepts that we, that we started talking about in these first, first couple workshops. So again, some of the key tasks that we were assigned with, um, with respect to the RFP, we're looking to, to implement certain um, certain goals and objectives that were identified in the 2013 comp plan amendments. Um, resolve a number of inconsistencies and then codify a number of zoning practices that have been uh, implemented through uh, administrative interpretation through the years. Um, looking at incorporating uh, new standards, programs, processes, again, for sustainable, um, to facilita facilitate sustainable community and neighborhood growth, and then include, where appropriate, graphic illustrations uh, so you're not reading that section of the code and wondering, well, is it this way, is it that way? Um, we want to make sure that the, la the language is very, very clear, very uh, succinct. Um, and where there might be that issue, make sure that there's a, a graphic to, to, to explain it. Um, so some of the major issues that were identified uh, initially um, through the RFP, again, was, was making sure that, that the LDRs are consistent uh, with, with the comp plan. Again, resolving those inconsistencies and the incorporation of the new standards. And the reason I have that underlined is these were sort of broken out a little bit more. So the first, the first bullet point was the workforce housing ordinance. Um, the second was an incentive uh, program for creating or maintaining market rate rental. Climate adaptation, uh, which we'll talk about this evening. Green building standards, again, which we'll talk about this evening. Uh, urban design guidelines, which was the topic last night and <clears throat> arch landscape architectural standards and signage. Again, these were items that we discussed last night. Um, for those of you that weren't here, um, the, both the workforce housing, the parking, and, and complete streets, all of those, both workshops and presentations are available on, on the website. Um, so you'll be able to access those if, if, you, if you do want to um, go back to those. Um, and then revise parking generation standards and provide parking mitigation strategies. 
So what we did is we grouped the major issues. Um, and as Thaddeus mentioned, this, was our, this is our fourth installment. So this is sort of the last um, uh, sort of fact finding, um, looking at uh, preliminary concepts, getting feedback. Um, but one thing I wanted to mention is sort of the adaptation sort of served as the common denominator uh, for all of it. So as we get through, you might say, well, didn't they bring this up in parking? Yes, we did, because we wanted to make sure that this was sort of the theme, through, theme throughout. So, so tonight we're going to focus really on, on four areas, greenhouse gas, sea level rise, sheltering in place, and green infrastructure and building standards. With greenhouse gas reduction, it's, you know, how can land use regulations play, play a role? Well, one, you want to make sure that, that again, you, you encourage development patterns that are less, um, less auto-dominant. Again, this goes back to the parking standards and, and some, of the other, uh, some of the other design uh, criteria. Preserving the, the existing trees to sequester carbon dioxide and promoting alternative energy uh, generation such as solar wind um, that don't rely on, on power plants. So some of the strategies that, that we're initially looking at is, um, again, transportation management demand programs, doing a true shared parking. The way the shared parking works now is it's allowed, but it doesn't, it doesn't provide for that sort of reduction. Um, it doesn't look at the time frames uh, as, to, as far as what spaces are being used at what time. It's just the commercial provides this, residential provides that. So it's really to look at, at standards that were developed by the, the, the Urban Land Institute um, and, and coming up with a true shared parking. Um, looking at putting parking maximums in rather than minimums. Um, some places are, are extremely overparked, um, particularly in this type of community where a lot of people walk, they bike, or they use scooters. And really looking at the promotion of, of bike corrals. Um, they are already here in the city, but it's just making, making sure they're more pronounced and including that as part of the streetscape plan. Um, for those areas that are paved, look at, look at implementing or requiring solar reflective coating on surface parking lots. Um, looking at permeable pavement, whether it be for parking lots, whether it be for driveways, for residential uh, properties. And also the use of bioswales, and it could be used in a number of ways, whether it's within a, within a surface parking lot or uh, within a, you know, sort of taking back the swale was one of the areas we talked about last night. Um, uh, one of the other strategies that I always think is, is pretty interesting is, are the green roofs. Um, and how they help to, to lower some of the energy costs. Um, they can also be integrated to help meet stormwater requirements, um, habitat recreation. And there's a variety now of, of methods to use. Um, obviously, you have to look at, at, at the weight and whether or not the structure can, can take that. Um, but there are, new, um, there are new methods that are being developed, uh, particularly for Florida, um, that work in combination with the standing seam roof so that it, it, you don't have that heavy weight load. Um, it's a little bit more um, uh, resistant to, to, um, to heavy water use, as well as being uh, airborne in, in, a, in, a, in a high wind uh, uh, situation. So, so the, next, the next area um, that we'd like to hit on is sea level rise. And um, you know, it, it's one of those things, we've all heard about it through the years, and there's been all of these debates. Um, at least we're allowed to say it. We're not, the, we're not a state agency, um, but it, it's, it's eminent. I mean, it, it, it's a matter of time. Um, you know, in this year, the Florida legislature is requiring um, that coastal management elements and redevelopment elements now include that as part of their policies. Um, they don't necessarily say the word, um, but, but it, is, it is there. So keeping that in mind, you know, looking at sort of the basis for sea level rise regulations. And again, this is sort of the first step. We, we have some time, but, but now is the time to really start, to start looking at this you know, over the next, between now and the next 30, 40 years. Um, but looking at scenarios for increasing sea, uh, sea levels, development in these, in these coastal high hazard areas, um, what they do, uh, what could be the expected development, and then increased risk of damage structures will cause collateral damage. Obviously, there's damage moves, water, water moves structures. In looking at it with, with FEMA maps and storm surge, unfortunately, they don't take into account sea level rise. Um, so as the, you know, as sort of it, it becomes more eminent, um, whether or not FEMA will, will ultimately change their maps, I mean, that, that's not in, in the cards right now, but I think it's something to, to still consider 
as we're continuing, you know, or starting to raise the structures um, and, and adding that freeboard. Hand in hand with that um, is the community rating, sy community rating system. Uh, it's, it's a voluntary program as part of the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, there's a number of communities, there's a, there's a rating system that goes from 10, uh, which sort of is non-participating, uh, all the way to one. Um, and there's a, and really the goal is to start putting in sort of these strategies to help homeowners get a discount on, on their flood insurance. Um, as I mentioned, again, you, you can go from a, you know, a class one or could receive up to a 45% premium discount, uh, which would be pretty substantial, particularly here. Um, but even a class nine uh, where you would get a 5% discount, I think is still, uh, a, a still very attainable uh, and would still obviously help save, help save people uh, money. So again, the intent as we start to move through these things is, is keeping in mind, how can we continue to make one, protect the city, make it more resilient for the residents, but also at the same time, help keep it affordable for people, um, particularly with the unknown with flood insurance, right? When we own a house, it's our mortgage and insurance, we kind of know what that, what, I'm sorry, the mortgage and, and interest, we kind of know what that is. Taxes, for the most part, we save our homes. But the wild card is always the, always the insurance. I mean, there were times where I was dropped to be renewed by the same, the same company, but only to have a much, a much higher rate. So we're trying to keep all of these sort of uh, uh, um, these things in, 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 in sort of in the back of our minds as we're writing these. And so, so there, there's essentially, I think it's four series um, or five series. We pulled these out because these are what we think we could sort of look to or look at addressing as part of, as part of the LDRs. And so for example, um, I can get in there. In, at 430, higher regulatory standards, max credits, 2,042 points. So again, you start looking at development limitations, um, prohibiting uh, buildings and our storage of materials in the um, special flood high hazard, uh, increasing uh, freeboard, um, enforcing V zone rules, enclosure limits, prohibiting first floor enclosures. So again, a lot of this stuff the city's doing, but I think as we continue to draft these regulations and keep these in mind, um, we want to make sure that, that what, what, what we're doing is, uh, is still helping the city promote and, and get the CRS rating back. Um, open space preservation, um, natural function of open space, incentives, and the natural shoreline protection. Um, things that can be easily attain, attainable. Um, stormwater management regulations. Uh, again, a lot of the regulations that we're looking at, particularly with, with landscaping and open space, uh, are looking to deal with just that, with stormwater. And then looking at a watershed master plan is, is one, of the other, um, one of the other areas to, to garner points. Acquisition relocation, uh, encourage communities to acquire, relocate, or otherwise clear existing buildings out of the flood uh, hazard area. Flood protection, retrofitting, as, such as elevating buildings, uh, which you know, the city recently obviously passed a referendum to, to assist with that. And then look at um, structural flood control projects, enlarging culverts, storm drain improvements, retention basins. Given the land, you know, the land areas, some of these aren't going to be able to be maintained or, or achieved, but there are a variety of, of I think, of, of items that can be. So sort of bringing this together in, okay, how can we, how can we write regulations to deal with this? Um, you know, there, there's sort of four ways that, that we looked at addressing sea level rise. You know, creating a protection zone. Um, looking at an accommodation zone, looking at a retreat zone, which won't apply because where are we going to retreat to? Um, there's only so many people that can go to the middle of, you know, to the middle of the island and preservation zones. So keeping it in that context, um, we thought, you know, let's look at examining two methods. One would be, would, would be a floodplain conservation overlay zone. The second would be a floodplain accommodation overlay zone. And when I talk about these overlay zones, I'm, I'm not looking, and you know, we're ta not talking about hu huge swaths of land that's going to cover, you know, miles and miles, but those areas where they're the, the most, um, most susceptible to flood or have been um, repetitive lost properties for, for a long time, start looking at a way to, um, to implement this through a land development regulation to sort of help combat that um, in, in the future. 
So again, the, the conservation overlay is, is really designed to protect natural resources and provide for gradual relocation of development, again, in the high, highly vulnerable areas. So the regulatory framework, what can you do? Down zone, which nobody, you know, nobody likes to hear that word, um, but if you do down zone or limit, uh, there would have to be some sort of mechanism, obviously, to, to, for that property owner. Um, one, one of those could be whether these funds will ever exist is the amendment one that was passed, um, the Florida Land Acquisition Trust Fund. Um, obviously, there's the Monroe County Trust Fund, but we also think it, it, might be, it might be suitable to look at a transfer development right in this sort of situation. Um, whether you start looking at increasing setbacks, doing a max, you know, maximum practical setback, limiting size and height, and then restricting rebuilding um, within, these, within these areas. Um, again, looking again at a historic, historic uh, exemption if, if it was necessary. The accommodation overlay, uh, again, is to allow continued development while requiring structures be cited to be built, with, with, to be built more resilient to impacts. Um, and again, we're, these wouldn't be, you know, let's cite a hospital here or let's cite sort of a critical service. It's for, you know, can we get it out of the flood zone? Can we start building these structures to be a little bit more resilient? So again, of course, you could look at, at down zoning, again, li or limiting new development of critical facilities. Again, this goes back to the hospitals, the emergency rooms, the, 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 the clinics. Um, but then again, require maybe those intense uses to either get an approval through a, through a special, per, special use permit uh, where maybe some conditions would, would have to go onto that property and or transfer development rights could be another tool. Again, we look at, at increasing setbacks, um, look at an erosion-based or tiered setback approach for some of, these, some of these waterfront properties or near waterfront properties, uh, looking at allowing them to have an additional freeboard. Uh, again, this would only be not to give them more, you know, more house um, but to get them out of that, to get them out of that high impact area. And again, limiting, this, limiting the building size to what, essentially what, what's there now. And so what we looked at is, as far as, the, as creating a TDR, um, and again, this is nothing set in stone, it's just sort of, you know, let's think through this process. How, how can maybe this work for, whether it's a residential property, whether it's a, a commercial property, uh, so on and so forth. So we looked at it and sort of the example was, all right, let's say the, the property's worth $2.4 million. Um, we looked at, okay, the median, the median house um, in the city of Key West, $360,000. So we did the, we did the divide, 6.67, round up to seven units. And again, there would, this would have to relate whether or not we can get it through B-Pass. It might be a public benefit because we're, we're preserving an area. Maybe we can get additional units. Um, you know, without a doubt, there would have to be an affordability component to it. Um, but we think it's best to have them be market driven. Um, rather than the city dictate the sale of those actual units, um, the city would actually have to approve where they would go and the site, not necessarily how much you can sell your unit for. Let the market dictate, but know that they have to provide um, a, num a portion of those as affordable. Uh, some of those receiving areas, it's sort of like, okay, well, where do these, where do these units go? And again, we're not talking about, you know, 100 or 200 units, it's gonna be, you know, I don't wanna say surgically looked at, um, but it's gonna be looked at in a narrow, in a narrow, in a narrow fashion. Um, but whether or not, I know the city's talked about creating an adaptation area. Um, this might be something that, where those units can then be relocated. Um, looking at the city owned property that, that's currently available. And again, adding to the, to the accessory units. Uh, this again goes back to that adaptation plan or, I'm sorry, the adaptation area, um, where you looked at, you know, I think Allison had, had a presentation that, that she had um, a few weeks ago maybe um, that showed where somebody could possibly, as they're raising their structure, build an accessory unit um, sort of as a temporary basis as that structure is raised. So I think, you know, we're trying to think a little bit outside of the box, but also keep it in the, in the context of Key West, because um, there's not any other examples sort of to look at, um, but I think it, there's, there's definitely options um, that, that we can achieve the, the overall goal. And so sort of in looking at it, and, and I don't like to say, well, well, they told us to do this, or, but, but in the context, at least I wanna, I wanna bring to the for, forefront that it, is, it isn't just a few, you know, it isn't Al Gore saying it anymore. You know, it, it, it's coming from a number of people. 
you know, the, the Florida action, action team looked at, looked at these goals. Um, one of the things they recommended was, was um, looking at transfer of development rights. Um, the EPA uh, went as far as, as recommending um, that treating non-conforming, treat these structures as non-conforming if they're vulnerable to 100 centimeters over the next 100 years. We're not recommending that. Um, but again, they also suggested looking at, at, at programs such as TDRs to transfer, trans to compensate um, land development, or I'm sorry, land owners. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the other areas that Thaddeus mentioned that we think is, is extremely worth, worth implementing here, particularly is, is sheltering in place. You know, and, and what is sheltering in place? It's, it's hardening the main structure system while providing a protection of the interior space. And I know that we, you know, we're going to hear, well, storm surge, and what about, the, you know, what about a Category 5? Um, I, I think we have to look at it in, in, in that context. Um, but again, how many, you know, we haven't had that many Category 5s. And if we do have one, you know, whether you're here or we're up on the mainland, I think we're all in for um, a, a, a big issue or a big problem. Um, FEMA recently came out with, with a document, Safe Rooms for Tornadoes and Hurricanes. Uh, it's a large, you know, 180-page document that, that you can uh, download. Um, and in fact, the, the Florida Building Commission, uh, Technical, Technical Advisory Commission, um, they actually looked at this as part of a feasibility study in, in 2014 and commissioned uh, the University of Florida through their construction um, engineering department uh, to come up with sort of some guidelines for retrofitting, uh, which was interesting because they didn't talk about new construction. It was only focused on retrofitting. Um, but when the results were given, the, the commission voted not to, not to continue with the research because of the cost of retrofitting, but in addition that this FEMA guide was coming out, in addition to um, ICC, which is the International Council of Code, I think is, the, is what ICC stands for. Um, they came out with safe room standards, so they didn't think that it needed to sort of be repeated in, in the Florida Building Code. Um, but, but we wanted to at least show, um, you know, first of all, if we are sheltering in place, what does it mean, category one, two, three, four? What, what type of damage does that do? Um, so when we looked at the, at the FEMA um, uh, book that came out, they have a great, you know, a, a great graphic that shows that. Um, and I think for the most part, all of us have lived probably through a category one or two, maybe even some of five, depending where you were. Um, but again, with, with our construction standards here, you know, getting through category one, category through two, probably even a three, we might be able to shelter in place. Um, four or five, again, you know, I, I think we're, we're in a different, in a different ball game. Um, obviously, storm surge is one of those um, other factors. Um, but again, you know, I, I think we have to start looking at it. And like Nikisha you know, Nikisha always jokes, well, I live in the Bahamas and we always had a shelter in place. Um, but I think it's one of those where, where we have to start looking at, at you know, does it really make sense to, to, to go somewhere else? Um, this was part of the com commission study. They sort of took the, the typical Florida ranch-style home and, you know, what, what, can, be, what can be done? So, so it's sort of reinforcing the walls um, on the interior, uh, sort of stiffening those walls, almost creating like a sheer wall um, on the inside. And then within that, within that building, they looked at, at four sort of possibilities of, uh, of storm shelter locations. And the first being um, in a closet. So they went so far as providing details, um, which, which we thought was at least, you know, we wanted to show it, uh, whether or not this gets adopted as sort of a local amendment or, or pushed more for new construction. Um, I still think it was you know, something that, that we wanted to bring, bring attention to. Um, of course, bathroom shelter, um, laundry room hallway. So what I think the good thing is at least the state is starting to look at it. It's like anything, you know, they, they always, you know, that building commission is tough. Um, sometimes they don't want to change a lot of things, but um, I think at least that, that, that it's getting out there and it's, I think it's just a matter of time before, before it ultimately gets, um, gets into the code. Keeping with that, looking at, you know, green infrastructure and, and building standards, um, one of the things, again, we keep going back to this storm water, and, and we talked about last night um, the amount of variances that are being requested 
and what that's doing for with the pervious area and we're losing and it's, it's forcing water into the rights of way and, and flooding and all of these things are occurring and you know whether or not people get start paying a, a surcharge on stormwater or, or have to do some other mitigation method you know for though what, what, what do we do for those people that have are really providing more than they need to provide um, do we look at possibly a discount um, for, for stormwater or for new construction that go, that go above and beyond? Do we start looking at ways to, to sort of incentivize it? Um, and, and that would play into some of these development incentives. So let, you know, let's look at promoting it rather than just, just sort of maybe they'll, maybe they'll do it. And this is sort of just you know, how, how the stormwater fee works now. It, 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 the way it is here, it, it, it's, it's assessed just about everywhere um, on, on ERUs, and I won't get into the, into that whole, the whole full discussion of ERUs. Um, but we looked at sort of, you know, how, what could be the framework for a stormwater fee discount? So what, you know, what's the goal? You know, what's the ultimate goal that, that of this discount? So you see in the first, so one, reduce the impervi imperviousness, make sure that, that the water is being managed on site, look to reduce the volume, and then use of specific practices. And then so sort of the, me the mechanism, so we looked at, at how that can be done and then how it could be implemented. Um, so the way we started, sort of crafting this initial, you know, the, the initial sort of thought of, of, of a credit program would be to provide sort of financial environmental incentives to customers um, that sort of maintain or, or promote um, sound practices and then provide that opportunity to, to basically reward them for that. And some of the residential credits um, could be rain barrels, um, greater than 30 gallon capacity, could be a one-time credit on the bill um, you know, I've, I've seen some where they're $25 all the way up to $100. Um, so again, there, there's, I think there can be a, a multi-pronged approach. Um, ironically, cisterns uh, is, are, are being brought, and the city already requires that. Um, so it, it, it is a good thing. Um, limit the impervious surface areas. You know, again, we talked about that last night and sort of this, you know, the remaining 750 square feet after you take out the, the the um, building coverage and lot area, and is that enough to, is that enough, or do we look at changing the way we have impermeable surfaces? Do we start looking at, at the type of, of pavement that's being put down? Um, do we look at permeable pavement in, in certain areas? One of those areas could be, again, the driveways. Um, whether it's 375 uh, square feet or greater, making sure that it's at least 80% min minimum pervious. Uh, making sure that the grade exceeds 3%. You know, a lot of the properties that have been paved as you drive along, you, s you, you see the pitch, you know, so everybody's driveway, it, it just, it flows to the street um, where they're supposed to be maintaining that on, on their site. So it's again, starting to look at it differently and, and what can we do from a regulatory standpoint as far as making that, making that happen, but not in a, too, in, in a very onerous, in an onerous fashion. For non-residential, um, for the most part, there's two ways to retain water, right? That you can do it through retention, um, which goes through infiltration. It treats the groundwater. And, and a lot of people say, well, I don't have a system now, and, and my water, it goes through the parking lot, but it, it does, but it doesn't go through a filtration system. So all of the oil or whatever is else dumped in that lot gets, gets taken down, into, taken down into, the, into the system. So we looked at, again, just initially on a 25 year, 24 hour storm event, you know, what would be retained on the property. Um, and, and we looked at it with a f on a formula basis, and I won't get into um, all of the math and the curve numbers and uh, all the logarithms, um, but looking at it, <laughs> um, you could look at, again, this would be a dry pond system which is designed to retain one inch of runoff prior to discharge. Would be would be around a 13% credit um, for uh, for stormwater. For those that have a detention system, um, it would be proportionate to the um, to the runoff rate. Uh, but again, this would only be uh, a 50% credit would only be applicable. And again, it, I won't get into the, the coefficients and and um, and the routing and the runoff ratios, but they would look at uh, something around a 45% credit in, in in this situation. Green building standards, um, as this becomes more, you know, starts to become more at the forefront, um, 
ICC came out with, with a 2012 version of the National Green Building Standard. Um, so this was the, the sort of the first green building code, if you will, um, that was put out there. Um, and ANSI actually uh, adopted it, which so for as far as standards go, that's, that's sort of the, the, you know, the stamp that you want on, on your book. Um, so ICC 700 provides um, for green practices that can be incorporated in every, you know, new, new homes, multifamily buildings, remodeling, hotels, motels, um, even the way sites are developed. So the way we sort of approach this is, okay, let's look at, let's look at all of our options. We're not gonna necessarily recommend one now, but these are the ones that we wanna explore. So the first was, was, the, was the ICC. And they have four, four threshold levels. They have a bronze, a silver, a gold, and emerald. Um, so it provides you with, with a multitude of, of selections. And they have a very entry level um, standard all the way up to one of the, you know, one of the higher level achievements. Um, offers a lot of flexibility uh, again, this code, like most of the ICC codes, were looked at on a national basis. Um, it could be something that could be implemented as a local amendment, and it could be a, a good first step um, where, uh, where you're not making everybody be lead, you know, lead silver. Um, the, the second option is making everybody lead silver or, or bronze or, or afford a green building um, uh, uh, commission standard. Um, and this would, this would apply, and it's already in the code, one thing that we wanted to add in was making sure that if, if it's substantially renovated, whether it, that means 50% of the value or more, um, that you, you have to have some sort of certification for your, for, your, for your building, whether it be residential or commercial. And sort of the third option we looked at is, is sort of like the Chinese menu of choices where um, whether you have, you know, you have to reduce potable and, and wastewater through the implementation of a gray water system. Um, they have them now where they can be part of the, part of the sink and the toilet run off of the same, off of the same system. Um, this would, would, could work for residential, um, particularly the, the ideal would be for institutional and hotel motel uses, uh, since they're some of the larger users, users particularly with laundry. Um, use of solar, uh, making sure that within the historic district, if it is used, um, I know there are some, some standards in the, um, in the guidelines, but making sure that, that, that it's not gonna interfere with, with the, the architectural integrity. Uh, again, looking at that pervious pavement, uh, the reflective, uh, solar reflective pavement and various other elements. Um, this could also be something that, that's, that's sort, of a, uh, sort of a good first step. Um, and then again, the, the green infrastructure, gray water it seems to be a discussion all the time, a lot of places, uh, even more so here. I mean, you're, you're at the end, you know? Um, so, so, so what do you, do, you know, what do you do? Do you invest in this um, huge purple pipe system um, that may or may not pay for itself in the long run, or do we look at at sort of some individual? Um, I don't want to call them individual package plants, but m could be. Um, these are just some examples of um, you know the graphic shows where where typically the water that's used for the toilet comes from um, sink, shower, um, or laundry. There's there's a, a pretreatment. You know, it goes next to your water heater, uh, so it's not too onerous of a system. Um, but again, these are possible um, incentives that can be used, not just for, for reducing water, but also for keeping costs down over the long run um, for someone that's, uh, that's someone that's on a fixed income. Keeping with, keeping with green infrastructure, again, looking at how we create sort of microgrids and, and smart grids throughout the city. And looking at you know whether we start going on the you know the timers where things get turned off, but I, but I think it, we're we're getting to that level now where where these you know we kind of heard about them, um, but I think it's it's time to really start looking at the implementation of these, um, and it might be again starting off slow and 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 making sure we fully understand the impacts of it, um, but but looking at how we can reduce the overall the overall carbon emissions. And, and lastly, this is you know, something to consider. It's sort of out of the realm of, of, of the LDRs, but they go hand in hand. Um, you know, there's, there's the, um, the Florida Green local government. You know, one thing that, that you know, Thaddeus and I, we, we were talking about earlier and, and you know, with, with how, to, how to address storm water and, and you know, you'll, you'll hear about these methods that these cities are now using that seem so innovative. And it's like, well, wait, Key West has been doing that already for 10 years. So it's sort of like, let, let's start to look at, you know, may, maybe it makes sense as we bring forth these new regulations, 
to, to look at trying to get this certification. And it, it, to me, I look at it as one of those, it, it's, I don't necessarily know what it will, you know, whether it's gonna bring you all the, you know, additional money, it, it will bring at least some recognition, but I also think it helps as we're, we're continuing to work for that CRS rating, um, it shows that we're taking, you know, we've taken the steps forward and, and we're serious and, and these are things that we've implemented. We're able to achieve this and, and we want to continue to push for, for that CRS rating to, to lower the, to provide the residents with the discount. That's it, what I have. Um, where, we're, where we're going um, from, from tonight <laughs> um, through October, we'll start, start sort of formalizing these concepts, um, regulations, and um, starting to prepare the illustrations. Um, in November, what we'll do is we'll submit a draft code um, from making sure that we have all of the input. Uh, we'll show the web address at, at the end. Um, would I ask everyone, to, if you have comments, please give them to us, but also feel free to, to write, you know, send them by email. Uh, one thing that what, what we will do at the, you know, as we cr create that final document, we'll have an executive summary and, and any comment that was given, we'll make sure that it's there so everybody sees that um, it, it wasn't just like, oh yeah, they said it. Um, you know, we, we, we will look at everything that, that uh, someone, someone comments on. Um, once, we, once we work through the final draft um, in, in December, it, we will publish it so that way everyone will have a chance to look at it. Um, and that's when it's really gonna come together and, and some of the concepts are, are real for, for the most part. Um, and you'll see how they, you know, is this gonna affect my property and, and what way can I deal with this? Uh, and that's when we would come back for, for the, you know, sort of the final workshop. And you know, we're still looking at how we wanna do it. Um, I always envisioned at least doing it over, over two, you know, whether we do it over two days, whether we do it over a weekend. Um, if, I'm, if I come for a day or two days or three days, it, it, you know, it, it doesn't matter. Um, but we thought maybe have an open house one day that way if, if somebody can't make it or they're working or you know, wants to talk a little bit more in detail, uh, we, we would make ourselves available um, to, to meet in person. Of course, you can call anytime on the phone. Um, then we would look um, planning, um, going to planning in, um, for public hearings. We looked at two, uh, just given the, the, the amount of detail uh, that we'll be looking at uh, February, March and coming back to commission uh, for adoption, first reading and adoption, April, April, May. So that's sort of the, the timeline where we are. So we're, we're still, we're, we're, we're starting to, to get over the hump, but we're not quite there yet. We still have a lot of work to go, a lot of work to do. Um, so this was sort of our, our last in, in the major issues. And by all means, um, we'd be happy to entertain any discussions. Uh, please feel free to go to the website. Uh, if you do put your comments and um, in your email, We'll have that and we'll be able to uh, provide updates once things are, are prepared and are being published.